our Old Testament scripture reading for this morning, as well as the sermon text, comes from Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 27. The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the desert to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the miraculous signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? Then I should obey him and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The Lord, or the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the foremen went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it because your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. The Israelite foremen appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked, Why don't you make, meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite foremen went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, Yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy. That's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite foreman realized they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officers and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us go now to our God in prayer. Lord God, we come before you knowing that we are nothing as without you. We ask that you would speak to us, that you would reveal your truth to us, that you would 
indeed uh, use your word and the, and the Holy Spirit that is within us to guide us in the truth, to lead us in the truth. And indeed, Father, that you would show us how your word speaks to us, even here and now. We pray all of these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, this morning, as we come to chapter 5, we are supposed to come to this text feeling a certain way about it. You know, as you've watched Israel in Exodus 1 groaning under the heel of Egypt, as you've seen the sort of burden that's been put upon the backs of the people of God and how poorly things have been going for God's people, it is certainly the intention of this text that as we come to chapter 5, that we are to feel hopeful. For the first time in a long time, it seems as though it is sure now that it is a sure thing, that good things are about to come. God has finally raised up Israel's unwilling Savior, and he has come down from the mountain of God to Egypt, and he has spoken to the people through the voice of Aaron. Signs and wonders have been performed before their eyes at the end of chapter 4, and God's people see and they hear all that God has promised to do for them. And if the chapter or chapter ends and they worship and praise God because he will redeem them, because God has promised to do this thing. He will care for them. God has sent his Savior to deliver his people. God is being faithful. He's fulfilling his promises to Abraham and Jacob from long ago. Things begin to look very hopeful. And the people of God seem ready to follow the Lord at his word. At the sound of his short voice, sure, they will follow him wherever he will go and have them go. There will be no grumbling or complaining, but the people of God will simply follow him. And surely God will now be get on with the story already and do what he said he would do, delivering his people from bondage. The people believe that he will be true to his word. What more could possibly be needed now? And we are ready for the happy ending to begin here in chapter 5. And yet, that is not how God chooses to work. See, people of God, we will be sorely disappointed if we are looking for the happy ending now, both here in our text and in the here and now. And that is true both here in Exodus and in our own lives. I mean, everyone likes a happy ending, uh, uh, but that's not the story of our lives, is it? Not yet. You know, we like to move from one happy moment in life to the next, pretending that life will always be good, and that's not how life works in life, we go through difficulties and hoping that things are, are going to be better in just a moment, we end up jumping from the firing, frying pan and into the fire. Many times, instead of things getting better, we'll see them get worse. Instead of good coming, only pain will now come. And as we see this, as we experience this in our lives, we must ask ourselves, what kind of deliverance is this? What kind of deliverance is before us? We're going to see the people of God go from slavery into deeper slavery. A fact that is very hard to make sense of. Life will be more miserable than before. We realize in many ways, this is your life. Because life is not as calm and as peaceful as you want it to be. Many times we do not get what we want. And yet, as we look to what God would say to us in the midst of this, we can know that is exactly the way God wants our lives to be at the moment. Our text opens up this morning, and the first thing we see is a challenge to the throne. A challenge to the throne. As you come to Exodus chapter 5, 
you know, uh, we've already uh, been pointing out, God's people are waiting for good things to come. They are now calmly, patiently preparing for God to release his people from bondage and slavery, to assert his uh, uh, dominion over his people, over Pharaoh himself. And that's exactly what we're going to see happen here in a moment. God is going to put his claim upon his people as his own. And so notice what happens in the text. Moses and Aaron go into the presence of Pharaoh, just as God has commanded them to do. And they speak boldly for the Lord, saying the very words that God has put in their mouth to speak to the people. And they get right to the heart of the matter. They say, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. I want you to let my people go so that they can go worship me and honor me and have a feast in my name. I want my people to be under my power and not yours anymore, Pharaoh. Moses says it with all the authority of heaven itself. Surely these are the words that God has spoken to him. God is commanding you, Pharaoh, to do this thing, to let Israel go because God's firstborn son must be set free because they don't belong to you. They belong to Yahweh himself. And Pharaoh says, okay, no problem. Just let me know if you're leaving for a week or 10 days. Is, uh, you know, uh, I understand you need uh, uh, to enjoy a little vacation time. If that's what you want to call your wilderness trip. No, of course not. But what do we see instead? Pharaoh says, excuse me? <laughs> Are you talking to me? You have any idea who I am? You know, remember what this scene looks like from his perspective. It would look utterly ridiculous to him. Here comes two Hebrews, a people who have been of the lowest class in Egypt for generations, and they stroll into the palace, into the very throne room of the most powerful being upon this earth, and one of them is an aged shepherd who might uh, even smell like a sheep right now, uh, who may be going senile, at least as Pharaoh is watching him. He's walking with his shepherd's staff, and his brother, a known slave, is before him. And they step into the throne room of the living God, if you will. Egyptians, whether they actually believe it or not, they all treated Pharaoh as though he were divine. That he is a God among men whom all others must bow before and cringe before. He holds the power of life and death in his hand. There is none more sovereign than he in all the land and in all the earth. And here comes this old man with a stick and his brother. And they say, God told us to tell you to let Israel go. Let your entire workforce go. And have a holiday, a little vacation, many days journey from here. And Pharaoh says, who do you think you are? Now, you're nothing. You don't mean anything. And I'm going to prove that to you when I say this. Who is the Lord? You know, if you... People have a God, which you must. You wouldn't be here. But if you have a God, he must be a little God. Because your people have been slaves to my people for hundreds of years. I can't remember a time when you weren't slaves. You were born slaves and you will die slaves and only the fleas will mourn your loss. Let me ask you, who is God here in this situation? Why should I obey your God's voice? He never demonstrated any reason why I should. I don't know your God, and I certainly won't obey his voice. I will not let Israel go. And so Moses and Aaron, they try again. They, this time they give a little warning of things to come. They say, the God of Hebrews met with us. Please let us go into the wilderness to sacrifice to our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with the sword. And that us is referring to both the Hebrews as well as to Egypt. God will fall upon this land in plague and he will hold the sword over them, ready to strike them. If you don't let us go, please let us go, they plead. God has sent Moses and Aaron to challenge Pharaoh's authority. This is the doing of the Lord, that he has sent them into his presence, ultimately saying, God's people fear our Lord more than any other power 
that this present evil age would hold. And Pharaoh hears all these words and he ain't having none of it. Pharaoh says, if that's the way you want it, then let's see who's boss around here. Let's see who wears the pants in this family. And the challenge to the throne becomes an all-out warfare. An all-out warfare. And so Pharaoh says, Moses, Aaron, gentlemen, why would you want to remove my restraints? Why do you want to take Israel from my yoke? You can hear the oiliness to it. Is my yoke heavy? Is it burdensome? Do you need a day off? Pharaoh really is taunting them a bit at this point. I mean, how dare anyone suggest that his burden is heavy or difficult? Pharaoh says, my burden is light. My burden is, or or my yoke is easy. You just need to keep doing and working harder and do more for me. And somehow you will be rewarded with your just reward. That is the way the world works. That is the way the world thinks, isn't it? You know, it's the philosophy of the world. If you want to get ahead in life, if you want to succeed, you need to work harder and longer and jump higher and run faster. And when you ask the question, when is enough? The only answer to that question is it will never be enough. You have to just keep going, keep working, keep excelling all the days of your life. There is no room for failure. You know, every single religion in the world except Christianity argues that the way to please the divine, the way to the good life is to work hard, to make yourself more acceptable. acceptable. Every activity in this world says the way to get ahead is not by rest. It is through heavy later. But no big deal. You can do it. Except you can't. God sends Moses to bring his people out of Egypt to deliver them from this bondage, this slavery, this heavy burden that only leads to death, that they may enter through the wilderness and find rest in him. And suddenly it becomes clear that these two worlds are colliding here. In one corner, you have a shepherd. And the weak ones of the world crying out for rest and worship. That is what their longing is for, that they would be able to worship their God and rest in him. And in the other, you have the greatest powers that be in this world saying, work is the only thing that will save you. A war war will wage between these two camps. God Almighty against the king of Egypt. God has sent Moses to warn Pharaoh of his intention and of the dire, uh, excuse me, dire consequences if he refuses. God has said, war is coming, Pharaoh, for I will bring my people into their rest. And when uh, 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 our text, suddenly our text turns and we see it is Pharaoh now who fires the first shot of the war. And it's Moses and Aaron, as they are standing before Pharaoh, Pharaoh decrees to his people, thus says Pharaoh. You have to hear that language, people of God. Everything God says here and Pharaoh say here is intentional. He is mimicking the language of our God and by it, he is saying, your God says, let my people go. Well, this God who is standing before you is the only God around here. And I say, let them go find their own straw. Let them go work harder. Let them go and uh, uh, fulfill the work that is set before them. Don't decrease the daily quota. Pharaoh, when he lets his people go, it's to go earn their own reward. Again, Pharaoh's solution, and you'll see this all throughout the text, is to make them work, 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 hurry, 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 work harder, jump faster, run harder. And Why does he do this? Why does this command come from the top down and lead to further oppression of God's people all throughout the land? Why is he pushing the people to work? For their salvation. It's in verse 9. So that people will no longer pay regard to lying words. Statement as well. It's not a neutral statement, people of God. If Pharaoh 
is God. Pharaoh is saying the words they speak that have been put in Moses' mouth are lies. And now, you people of Israel, you can either believe the lies of God or you can believe the words of your genera uh, generous Pharaoh God, who is only punishing you so that you remember who your father is. Pharaoh says, has God really said? No, I have said work, and by your work and by your devotion to me, you will be saved. He's claiming ownership over God's people, much as Satan himself seems to do or seeks to do. And so Pharaoh wars against God himself by warring against God's people. And there's nothing new here, people of God. The devil will always attack the children of God. He attacked Adam and Eve in the garden. He attacked the Christ. And now he prowls like a lion seeking to devour. Revelation 12 shows us this picture of the old dragon that he gets so angry that he cannot kill the Christ or the mother of the Christ. And so he wages war against the children of God, even calling God's truth a lie, as we see in our text here. And so the deceiver claims to be God, who in reality is an antichrist, makes life insufferable for the children of God. He makes things hard for them. He makes them toil and labor and work and work and find no relief from their labors. That dragon of old is whispering in Israel's ear, you are mine. You always belong to me. So we see at the end of this text, God's people begin to believe this lie, denying the truth of who they are called to be because they will no longer listen to the lying words of Moses. And we see a worshiping people become a complaining people. A worshiping people becoming a complaining people. Pharaoh has cracked down hard. He's increased their labors, making their burdens heavy. He is making their lives uncomfortable. Not just a little uncomfortable. This is a lot uncomfortable. And immediately what happens as soon as the comforts of Egypt, as small as they may be already, immediately we see God's people forget who their God is. And the reason for joy they had just a moment ago. It's a complete reversal. Things aren't going the way I want them to be, so my joy is now snuffed out. One day they are worshiping God, and the next moment they are angry with God for abandoning them. And abandoning him in turn for Pharaoh himself. And notice what they do. It says that the people cried out. And that's a phrase that we see all over the Old Testament, that the people cried out to God. That they cry out to their God, to their Lord. Only here, we see that they cry out to their God, Pharaoh. Saying, there must be some mistake. You wouldn't do this to your servants. Again, we who are the children of God are servants to God alone. And here Israel is seeking to placate their God, crying out to him, saying, Save us, O Pharaoh, O Lord God, for we live to serve you, to please you and you alone. But the only thing Pharaoh can tell them, the only way of salvation that he has to offer them is work, 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 for you are lazy. And the people suffer under Pharaoh's hand. God's people don't necessarily love their bondage. We saw them celebrating a moment ago God's promised release at the end of chapter 4. The only thing that changed is now they are suffering severely. And though they don't love Egypt, certainly whatever they used to be experienced was better than this. Fine, you know, at, at least as they see it, the frying pan was apparently better than the fire itself. And they say to Moses, why have you made us a stench in the nostrils of Pharaoh? Why have you made us a stench in the nose of our God? And it seems how quickly the people of God forget his promises. 
how quickly and easily we complain when we suffer. And even Moses, he turns to God in complaint and says, why are you doing this, God? One moment Moses is ready and willing to serve his God, and now he's having th second thoughts saying, things are tough all over now for the people of God. Why, oh Lord, would you work in this way? Why are you doing this when you promised them deliverance and salvation? And that is the word that came out of my mouth. Why in the world would you bring suffering upon them and harder? Truly, people of God, who of us can say that we react any differently? I mean, we read this text and we think, this people, they are so forgetful. One moment they have the joy at their coming salvation, but the second things go hard. The second things don't line up with the way they believe the world should be. The moment things do not seem to go according to their plan, the wheels fall off and they reject their God. They want nothing to do with him. And we want to point the finger at them and say, how dare you forget how good your God is. And yet, people of God, we are Israel. When we suffer, when things don't seem to be going the way we want them to, when everything in our life isn't happy and clappy, clappy and we suffer, we want to question God and say, why are you doing this? Why would you allow this? Surely you can't be in control. Surely there must be another. And yet God never, never once, never once in our text, never once in the history of Exodus or through the history of the scriptures or the history of the world has been out of control of what is happening in the lives of his people. And that may not be a comfort that you want to hear that God is completely control in this world. And that even means that the sufferings that he brings into your life somehow are under his control and serve his purpose, whatever purpose that may be. People of God, if you are suffering right now, you need to know your suffering does not nullify the promises of deliverance that he gives. His salvation and mercy and grace in Christ Jesus still are sure. They are the real deal. Our suffering, our lives, what we experience does not nullify the promises that have been given. Though Pharaoh may call him a liar, our pain, and our light, momentary affliction, as Paul would call it, light, momentary affliction does not mean that God is not true. We can still trust in his words. What, for what does he promise to his people? A moment ago, what did he promise them? He didn't say life will be easy. He didn't say I'm going to go through life, you're going to go through life without suffering. He promised I will deliver them from bondage and slavery and I will be their God. And they will be my people. And God will be true to his word, even sending forth his son to fulfill his promise, to bring the redemption from your sins, your love of that bondage by his death and resurrection. He frees you from it. So how should we understand our lives then in turn when we jump? from the frying pan into the fire, for seem many times in life things are hotter than we'd like them to be, and everything seems to be going wrong. People of God, we need to see God allows these things to be so that our hearts would not long for this world. If everything is perfect here, why would you ever want to leave? If everything is good, you never will see that God is turning your eyes to hope in him, to wait on him, to look for the fulfillment of the promises in him. God is surely at work even now and even in the things going in your life that you don't like, those things that you wish weren't happening, that you could cut out if you were given the chance in the midst of of them all, whatever they may be, whether trial or temptation or difficulty or good times going on, God will prove himself to be the wiser of us and true to his word. 
He will finish what he has started. And we will find our rest in him. That is ultimately what this is about. God bringing his people into his rest. Finding their dependence upon him, knowing that they do not earn their salvation through work, 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 but indeed that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That he has accomplished all that has been set or, uh, set before him. Indeed, that God ha- or Christ himself has gone to the cross, that he has carried our burdens. And that now means that our yoke is easy and our burden is light. And if that is true, people of God, then rather than complain and fight and backbite as we often tend to do, we can know that whatever it is that God is bringing into our lives is for his purpose. And we can find joy in it and peace that goes beyond all understanding. These things don't make sense to us in this world. I mean, surely we do find peace in Christ, but it is not because life is people, but it is because Christ Jesus has come into the world, and with his coming into the world, he brings rest and peace and joy to his people, even when it may not look like it at the moment. People of God, that is our hope. And it is a hope that sustains us in this day, And no matter what may come, no matter what you may face as you walk out those doors this day, God is for you in Christ Jesus. He is not against you. Though it may feel that way as you experience suffering, he will accomplish all that he has promised to do, namely delivering his people from the bondage of our own sin. And we can have joy in the midst of them knowing his word is true and that he is faithful to fill, fulfill all that he said he would do. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you and we admit our weakness. We do not like to do so, but we, we do because it is true. We do not like suffering. We do not enjoy the difficulties and trials that you bring into our lives. But yet, Father, you do this. You remind us that our hearts are not made for this world, but they are made to find their rest in you, their peace in you. Help us to do so, Father. Help us to see the cross of Christ Jesus ever before us, that it would shape everything about who we are as Christ followers. We ask, Lord, that you would indeed bring us joy in the midst of our sufferings, in the midst of our complaints, that we might see clearly again all that you have done for us. Lord, we ask that you would do this for your people. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.